Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Let's just get my Let's video on here for you. Hey, right, there we are. Yeah, I sliced up a whole back yeah, background for you today. That's really great. <laughs> yeah, why not, right? I mean, we're here to help promote the show and talk to you about the upcoming tour and whatnot. So why not give the audience the opportunity to see the dates and the poster right live and in action? Cool. Looks great. Awesome. So it's well, good to meet you. You too as well. And I, I thank you for taking the time today to speak with me. Yeah. Um, I guess I could wear earbuds, right? You can do whatever you wish. This is, this is a family show, but again, it will be eventually be on my YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, make yourself comfortable. Just a chill conversation. I've got a bunch of questions. Feel free to talk about yourself or anything you want at any given time. There's no real format here. Um, it's an opportunity to learn about you, the band, the tour, and sort of go from there. Sounds great. So um, are we already recording or are you going to let me know when we start? Oh, I, rec I started recording right when we, right when we got on initially. Okay, cool. So um, is the camera good this way or is this way better? Uh, I prefer it the other way, actually. You get a little bit more wide, but again, you shoot. That's you get a bit more width to it. That's better. I mean, that's more, either way doesn't oh, matter. Yeah. We, we can see you clearly either way. You know what it is, though? I have to look to the side to see ah, the camera. That's okay. Makes sense. No yeah. words. People understand so, that. There, then do that then. That's, that's perfectly fine to do that. Perfectly fine to do that. Okay, cool. You're bang on, so, straight on. No worries. All good. All right. So, um, nope. what I, well, my first question that I usually ask everybody that I have a conversation with is what was your first Grateful Dead experience and how did your long strange trip begin? <laughs> okay. I guess the first Grateful Dead experience was two parts. One was the, you know, hearing the music. The second was really the live concert experience, my first show, you know? So uh, when I was a teenager, probably about 13 or 14, my brother had some albums. I think it was um, Working Men's Dead, Europe 72, Terrapin Station, a um, bunch of those albums from the 70s. Yeah. And, and I was listening to like different rock and Neil Young. And then I heard the Grateful Dead and I was like, hmm, this is cool stuff, you know? And from that point, it just evolved. Um, my first show was in 79. I got to see Keith and Donna one time in Philadelphia at the Spectrum. And that was my first show. And then the second show was in Hampton, Virginia, and it was Brent on keyboards. And, nice. and I was like, oh, I recognize that guy because I had seen him with Bobby in the Midnight. So I knew who he was. And then from there on, I saw a couple hundred shows with Brent. Wow, oh, amazing. So, amazing. Yeah. Such a great trip during it. I mean, that's kind of like how I did hear it. But I mean, I did read in the press release that, you know, you did your commitment to music it goes back to, you know, a ragtime piano playing grandfather. Um, some hippie babysitters that uh, who brought guitars over to your house and whatnot. And then your mom used to teach classics like Heart and Soul. So tell me a little bit about, you know, from the age of 10, you know, you started playing guitar and whatnot. And you eventually, I know you're the keyboard player. So how did we get to that transition? And how did that all come to fruition before we get into obviously talking about the tour and the dates and whatnot? I want to hear a bit more about you. Do you prefer Wayne or Wayne? Or Either one is fine. Perfect. Um, but it's a really cool question because it's an interesting story. Um, when I was like five, four or five years old, I would always be mesmerized by my grandfather. He would play the piano all the time. and He was really good. He, he played, you know, ragtime. And um, I just would stand there as a little kid and stand behind him and watch him play for, for like an hour or more, you know, like just mesmerized. Yeah. So when I hit 10, um, I mean, when I was five, I knew I wanted to, you know, be in music you know I already knew then at five years old but by the time I hit 10 I started guitar and um a little bit of piano like like you mentioned my mom taught me a couple of the classics but um when I was about 13 I was a guitar player still like that was my primary instrument and I, I had a band with my brother so his friend came along who was also a guitar player and he wanted to join this band that we had and uh, he said, okay, so why don't you play bass? And I'm like, okay, I'll play bass. So they, they gave me a bass guitar. And for six months, I was the bass player in that band. The band was called Changing Planes. And um, about six months or so after that, the, guitar, the new guitar player's brother, who was a bass player, he wanted to join the band. So they said, well, why don't you play keyboards? You know, and I already had an interest in keyboards. So I was like, yeah, I'll play keyboards. So they, they actually went out and bought me two keyboards, a Fender Rhodes and a Farfisa organ. 
and they uh, nice they news. gave them to me and they said learn how to play and within two months I had learned and we were out there doing gigs um, and I had two months experience and and it kind of evolved from there. I was about 14, I think, at that time. That's pretty awesome. Because uh, you had a lot more, it seems like you had a bit more practical experience because you were, you know, a couple of months and you were already playing. So that's pretty cool to have that kind of, you know, background as opposed to just being lessons after lessons after lessons, correct? Yeah, I, I wasn't one to be able to sit there through the lessons. So in high school, I started studying theory and um, I graduated uh, in three years and got out as a junior, but I had as many music courses as possible all through high school anything related to music vocal choir anything I just took everything I could and then I went uh, to college for a bit you know and studied music theory as well but I couldn't sit through lessons I didn't have the patience so uh, I did formally learn music but as far as the lessons it's really self-applied from the theory that I learned in books you know that's awesome and it's oh wow that's even more impressive I mean being able to translate the theory to real practical use of it you know as opposed to vice versa um that's really cool you know i i that actually is very fascinating to me i mean knowing you know a lot of the obviously the keyboards not just with the grateful dead jerry garcia band you know those just absolute magicians at what they did you know all the way from merle melvin nikki hopkins and whatnot so you know keyboards for me i actually help a lot of local bands and the keyboards or organs have become a much more evolving sound for me that I'm that I'm becoming much more grown attached to. I always was like a huge guitar guy. I love the guitar, and and then as I've learned more and heard more of his playing and everyone else that's involved, I've really gravitated towards that the keyboards more so. So it's really interesting how in this particular instance, your band is. I mean, obviously being your band, it's a keyboard driven, or you're the leader. So that's cool to me because again, my buddy Joel in his in his JBoo's Boogaloo squad, he's the driver in his soul jazz band. So it just, it was quite the interesting concept for me to hear it from your perspective, obviously you being the leader of the band and whatnot. Um, and I also did read that, you know, at one point, um, this whole concept sort of didn't come from that, but I remember reading that you did actually at one point as a one-off decide to recreate the Radio City Music Hall tour in, 19, in the 1980s for the dead. And that sort of, was that the initial sort of beginning path that led to you wanting to do the recreation of the Europe 72? sort of tour? Yeah, that's how it evolved. So in 2012, I was just brainstorming and trying to think of different ideas, how to do something, you know, different and unique. And I came up with the idea to recreate a tour. And that's when that idea came to me. And then um, I was touring with like John Kalisic for a while and then different people around the country. And um, when I sat down and decided, okay, I want to put my own thing on the road and tour with Rainbow Full Sound, I thought, okay, so what am I going to do, you know? And then I started to think, and then it came to me, I was like, that's perfect. It's like yeah. my favorite live album, my favorite tour of all times, but why not do that, you know? And then I started to uh, think about the Europe 72 theme, and then I, I ran it past like Dennis McNally and Jack Barton, and they all loved it. They were like, hey, this is a great idea. Yeah, we'll get on board. So here we are, you know, uh, COVID shut us down and it delayed us, but it's okay, you know, we're resilient and we're, we're bouncing back and we're going to get back out there and gear up for the 50th anniversary, which was one of my plans all along, you know, I had started this like three, three years ahead of time, knowing that when the 50th anniversary hit, we would be prepared, you know? Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. Well, I mean, pandemic obviously slowed it down, but hey, all good things and all good time, right? I mean, you know, that, you know, us, us meeting and getting the opportunity now to chat with you myself, that wouldn't have happened if, you know, COVID hadn't occurred. So I, look, I'm not, I'm upset that you can get your tour off the ground at the time, but, you know, the opportunity for me to meet with you and chat with you. And, you know, I've already, I've actually already previewed the, the show, the 75 minute reel you sent me already. And it was received really well. I mean, I know a bunch of people from my channel, from the audience already looking to potentially come out to a couple shows. Um, cool. So that's been pretty cool in terms of that regard. Um, I know that the venues up behind me, I know you're starting off in, in Seabright, New Jersey on September 28th and ending down, let me go to the other side, ending down to 8x10 in Baltimore. Um, that's pretty cool, man. I've actually, a couple of these rooms, a couple of bands I've actually worked with, I've been to. So 8x10 is a really cool place. A couple of heads run that place. They're awesome people. Um, they are. Yeah, some of the places that I know as well. So really cool. Um, I wanted to actually touch on something. So obviously Rainbow Full of Sound is, is obviously a Grateful Dead term. We all know that. Um, what was the reason for selecting that, that 
that that name. I mean, I have a, I have a reason I think having to do with you know the revolving cast potentially of musicians, you know, or a rainbow full of sound. But I would like to hear why you specifically stayed on that particular name for the band. Um, it's one of those, yeah, it's one of those phrases that jumped out at me and I had a list of about 20 of them and I was narrowing it down. And I mean, one thing about Rainbow Full Sound is the rainbow and the colors, because one of my favorite things in the world is colors. Mm. You know, obviously I love music, but I also love art and I love colors. So that's why Rainbow Full Sound probably jumped out at me. But as I moved forward and the name was so well received everyone loves the name and it kind of took on more meaning as it all unfolded you know like you said it's a revolving cast of over 20 musicians so that kind of rainbow full of sound kind of describes that you know that large cast of all these different musicians um because everyone is different and unique in their own way um but um yeah it it was just a lyric line that jumped out at me. And then I didn't even know if I could use it because, you know, I understand that like song titles are not copyrightable, but lyrics are. Yeah. So I applied for the trademark and I was awarded it. And um, for whatever reason, I got it. Awesome. <laughs> you know, so I'm happy to have it because it's really become my, my main project. I, I do a lot of different things, solo with different bands, blues, you know, all kinds of stuff. But Rainbow Full Sound is the main main focus for the past couple of years and probably will be for the next couple. That's know? awesome. That's awesome. It's really, it's a yeah. Cool little story to hear how it all inter intertwined. I mean, again, you know, your love of art and color and then, you know, it being a revolving cast of musicians, I was going to say characters, but, you know, same thing at the end of the day. Uh, that's just really yeah. cool. I mean, really cool. I mean, that's got to be. How, how do you, how do you, I mean, I'm, I'm not a musician. I'm, I'm just going to lay that out. There was a disclaimer right there. I, I work with a lot of musicians and I, sort of, you know, I see the process from my point of view, which is doesn't mean anything. It's just my point of view. How do you maintain that, you know, that, that, that authenticity or that creative juices or that cohesion um, when you're playing with different members, especially with this kind of music? I mean, obviously, you know, you want people that obviously know the dead and know the spirit of the dead and, you know, how they like to explore and do different things. So how is that any more challenging for you or were some of these, we can get into the cast of, the cast of musicians now, um, or a lot of these musicians, someone you've obviously worked with before that have a little bit of that background in the Grateful Dead scene. Um, so that's kind of like a two part question, but just curious on how all of that sort of works for you in terms of being the lead and having to, you know, coordinate different musicians at different times. I mean, I'm not sure how many are playing with you. You know, do you play four in a row and then you switch it up sort of thing like that? Can you tell me a little bit more or tell us a little bit more about how that revolving cast works and what it's like to direct and be the music director for that as well? Yeah, it's actually. Uh, an interesting job. It takes a lot of time because when you manage a band, if you're a band leader, normally you have five members or whatever, you know, and that's what it is. Where this is like 20 to 25 people that I'm, you know, I'm my, my one friend calls it like herding cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I do is I kind of just try to channel the energy um, and go with the flow. I don't know that it's always me um, steering the ship, you know. <laughs> No, but for sure. I, I kind of trust my instinct and I just roll with it. But as far as um, the the current uh, cast, we've probably gone through close to 100 players over the past eight years, mm -hmm. you know, to, to get to this lineup of 20, you know. So the scheduling at this point, I'm, I'm really just um, following my instinct. And it's really availability at that point, whoever's wow. available, you know. But with the 20 to 25 person cast, generally any lineup we put together is a great one because we've already screened so many people to get to this 20 or 25, you know, the other others um, are still friends and everything. But um, we have this this current list that hopefully in the future, it'll maybe come down to 10 or 12. <laughs> Yeah, we were we had about 18. And then with COVID, we had to kind of make some changes because of, you know, the complications. So it ended up expanding where I was looking to downsize. I had to actually expand. Mm. But it takes a lot of time to manage this size you know, group. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, that's what I want to touch on because I, I get that. I mean, again, I mean, I work with the Fish Tribute Band out of Toronto. There's four of them and there's three of us crew. 
And even that sometimes is a, is a, is a disaster just to get all of us together uh, to go on the road. So I can imagine and know the effort and the, the time you've been putting into this project. I mean, obviously for many years now, and, you know, again, s selling on that name and working with that great group of people. I mean, it's gotta be a great, great thing for you as well. I mean, nice transition, you know, something you love. I mean, the music itself, the Grateful Dead, obviously, and that genre and, and, and where it comes from. I mean, the Grateful Dead in itself is its own genre these days, right? I mean, people say they're a jam band. I'm like, no, they're not. They're the Grateful Dead. They're not a jam band. <laughs> they, they were before that <laughs> stuff ever occurred. You know what I mean? Um, and so it's just really cool to hear that. And where, where are you specifically or where is like the main, like when you do play, where are you based out of? Are you based out of New Jersey or the East Coast? Yeah, Asbury Park area, ah. Asbury Park, New Jersey. So um, the majority of the players are between Philadelphia and New York City. And I live near Asbury Park. I was born and raised here. Oh, very and, cool. um, Yeah, so um, we have players as far down as Florida and some up in Vermont and New Hampshire. And then obviously a couple out in California, like when we went out there, we were lucky to have Bobby sit in with us and that was awesome. Yeah. Um, must be cool for him, you know, to see his, his song and the lyric, you know, when he first heard us, he might've thought, oh, Rainbow Full Sound, that's a cool name. <laughs> well, no, um, and, it, I did, and that opportunity to sit with you guys as well. I mean, it's all pretty cool. Oh, just lost your video. Uh, that's all right. Yeah, hold one second. Um, yeah, no worries. I had a call coming in. I don't know how to shut that up. But um, I, I was going to say that um, every time we play the song or sing the song, music never stopped when it gets to that line. The, the energy at that moment when, when those lyrics are spoken, it's just a cool moment. You know, every time we do it, it's That's a rainbow awesome. full of sound. You know? it's That's cool. awesome. I mean, I get, and I get especially for you, because again, it's your creation. There's that moment of you know, connection or peak, if you would have it, that, you know, as you approach that moment, it's just, again, it must feel, feel very rewarding for you as well, because again, you're, you're actually living and breathing this sort of, you know, fruition, this dream that you had or that you put together and watching it happen. And then again, being able to, as you mentioned, go west and play with Bobby and play with some of these other players that I did read about. I mean, uh, John, Kavlicek and whatnot. That's just, you know, fantastic to be able to immerse yourself in something you care or love so much. And to be able to also, you know, bring it back home with meeting the people and playing with them and then continuing it, you know, as you said as well, I mean, continuing the spirit of the Grateful Dead by recreating this. I mean, I don't think anyone's ever done this kind of a tour with Europe 72 specifically. And so that's really, really cool to, to, to connect with you. And I'm hoping that by the time, you know, hopefully somewhere down this road, I can actually cross the border. I'm actually up in Canada. So, you know, it, it's harder for me. I can't, the land border is still closed. So I can't actually physically drive to a show and, you know, fly in and fly out. It's gotta be a pretty predominant show and a lot of them for it to be worthwhile from a cost perspective. So I'm hoping I can get down, you know, closer to middle, like October, early November to maybe find some of these shows. Cause I'd be really interested because I really enjoyed the clip you guys sent along. And like I said, my audience really loved it too. Really was really well balanced, really mixed. The musicians sound phenomenal. So really, really cool that you shared that with me. Um, so my other thing I wanted to touch on really quickly was I wanted to know about, do you have any other, after this tour um, or what, are there any other plans um, for <clears throat> Rainbow Full of Sound again, or something you're still working on or what is it, what's the prospect for the future after this tour happens? Well, there's um, a spinoff group that, that uh, I just started and, um, First, the, the first thing is Rainbow Full Sound will be definitely doing some 50th anniversary touring next year in 2022. Um, there's a couple of other things I have going on that I haven't shared publicly yet, but this new group I can share, it's called Jazzadelic, and it includes Kenny Brooks, who's the sax player that played with Bob Weir and Rat Dog for 12 years, and he lives near me, so we played a few gigs together, and then recently we started... Um, you know, doing this jazzadelic thing. And I created these arrangements of Grateful Dead songs that are kind of jazzy, but they're more jam band than, it's not like Jazz is Dead where they did the, the heavy jazz. This is yeah. more of a ja jam band version of uh, Grateful Dead song, but with jazz influences. And it has Kenny doing a lot of the solos. So it's a lot of keyboard solos and sax solos, as opposed to guitar solos. And uh, we have a six string bassist, Jerome Parker Wells. He's from Sweden. And then we have, you know, drums and, and rhythm guitar. Um, but it's a really unique group and it seems to be catching some traction. So um, we will probably be uh, doing some higher end shows with that group. It's a pretty cool group. Um, one other thing that I launched this past year is the Psychedelic Circus, which is a flow artist troupe. And it includes like um, 
jugglers and hoopers and uh, you know the flow art instruments and it's pretty cool because on the set break they usually perform and then they'll join us you know throughout maybe the second set and there's a couple of different casts one in Florida one in the Northeast here and that's pretty cool too um, it came out of a story that I wrote and uh, it's kind of like this psychedelic story that I hope to um, finish someday but the the psychedelic circus is is a scene out of that movie kind of story that I wrote. And uh, I brought it to life um, before the story even is finished. Um, I'm gonna do like an animated version of that, but you know, like there's that saying, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And it seems I'm working like 80 hours a week. <laughs> I don't hate it, but the problem is I can't keep up with it because I, I did all the bookings for this whole tour myself. So right now we don't have a full-time agent. So I need to find like an agent and, and I need to get people to help me do some of these things because there's too much for one person to do. <laughs> as, as, well as, as well as learn the music and play the music and, and you know, <laughs> and get all the band members together and do the posters and the art and everything else and promote it and call Dennis and get Dennis to call. Yeah, I, I hear you, man. Uh, no doubt. No doubt. And, you know, that's sort of, sort of what I do is once I have these conversations, I'm actually, you know, I have, a, I have some free time in my hand and it's something what I'm doing with my YouTube channel has become more of a passion and a hobby. Um, it's not something I really make money from. I mean, people do give donations and tips and I use that money sometimes to give back, either buy more gear for myself to make certain productions I do better, or I'll use donate to local food banks or whatever, because I'm not really in this to, to make a profit from this. I mean, one day if it became that and I turned it into that, fantastic. But right now it's been just more about giving back and, you know, the opportunity to meet people like yourself and Dennis and Tony Saunders and some other people in the industry that I've been able to ha meet with recently and speak to Susanna Millman, Dennis's, you know, wonderful wife, the photographer. I mean, she was just one of my new favorite people I've ever met with in my life, Tony as well, and yourself. It's just been an awesome little journey for myself, you know, from my first ever Grateful Dead show when I was 15 years old, um, you know, and all the way till now. And I never thought I'd be doing anything like this ever in my life and you know how the spirit of you know it all came back to me so it's really cool to connect with you and to hear about all this and also to hear about your other projects so that's something that you know in the future if you know when you do get these things back up and running or when you're more fixated with it feel free to reach out I'm a social cool. media person I'm a YouTube person I'm happy to help re-push things promote them for you have another conversation if you want the time uh talking about the jazz adelic or any other project you're having so we can you know push it out to people so they can be aware of it and hopefully come out to the shows and support you because really that's what it's about it's really about keeping live music going um musicians need to work and people need to dance and hear that music and you know you're bringing the joy and the spirit and your magic is being created every single night with this tour and and stuff like that and people get the opportunity to really 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 go back in time a little bit and and experience some awesome music with some awesome people and some awesome musicians um is there going to be anything anything different about the the performances for europe 72 is it you know just like five band members six band members per show kind of thing will there be any horns layered in or anything like that or is it pretty much i'm not I'm not saying note for note but is it pretty much going to stay in a similar format as to Europe 72 in terms of the musicians that are playing in the band? It's pretty close. We use one drummer. And um, one of my favorite things I always say about the Europe 72 era was the two keyboard player combination of Pigpen and Keith, you know, Hammond organ and piano together really yeah. creates a unique sound. Um, with this group, we only have one keyboard player myself, but I do layer some of the Hammond on top of the piano, you know, like, Hammond on the left hand and piano on the right, for example. Um, the other uh, the other thing is, like I said, the drummer, we do use one drummer because that era only had Kreutzmann on drums and that made it unique. Um, as far as uh, no horns or anything like that, it's, it's pretty close to um, the, the actual 72 lineup. The only difference with this tour is it's our second time around. So we did get to finally finish informally the first tour because we got cut short halfway through. And we kind of informally finished it, but getting into the second time around, I'm finding that we're, we're ending up deeper into the cuts and the jams and the songs, you know? It's starting to change uh, because of that. And as we move forward, that's just kind of the natural flow of it, you know? Absolutely. Um, I mean, did you guys want to do? And you're evolving as you play. And that's, that's really the magic yeah. I was talking about in the spirit. That's awesome. 
And that I think that happened with the Grateful Dead too in, in Europe. It's almost like they came back from Europe as a different group, you know? Like when they went there, they started this new chapter and they came back and, you know, that whole experience for them um, brought them into the future from there, you know? And they kind of changed as a group right around 71, 72. And then as you, if you listen to them as they go out through the 70s, you know, it kept getting better and better and better. And then the 80s and then Brent joined and then it changed again, you know? It's cool to see how it evolves, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. And that, that's, that, that's why I was, that's why I kind of was asking about the difference. Like if you were, if not that I was, I was concerned about, it, I was just really happy to hear that it's staying as true to the form as possible because I think that, to me is a bit more authentic and I like that. Not that I wouldn't enjoy other players or more dynamic other instruments or whatnot, but I think as an expectation, not that I won't expect things, but I think that's just a really cool way to do it. And again, the fact that you've already done it, that's even more cool because you've got a little bit of that under the belt and you, like you said, you know, you, the musicians are more comfortable per se and know things differently. You feel each other a bit differently and you're more willing or everyone's more willing to explore. And that's really the spirit and nature of it. And that's, you know, in the end of the day, and if you explored a different jam that wasn't Grateful Dead, that would probably, probably be part of it as well, right? Because that's music and music has that ability to go different places. And, and that's just such an awesome thing. And I, I hope I can get down to a couple of shows. I'm, I'm looking, I got my eye right on the Halloween show uh, for Baltimore because I've obviously been to that venue before. And I know some people down there. So I've got my eyes on that. And that should be hopefully enough time if the border gets open that I can actually make that. And it's only about an eight hour drive for me. So it's not too bad. Um, uh, but that's it. So uh, one other question, is there anything else that you wanted to touch upon with the tour coming up or whatnot? Um, I know we're starting on the 28th. I've got the list up here. People can see the list. I will actually put that up for people when the event is over. I'll put that in the, um, the video for the video description of this interview. I'll put that in there as well so people can see that list. Um, anything else you want to talk about or mention before Rob, I ask you my last little set of questions that I ask everybody I chat with? Sure. I wanted to mention a few quick things. One Please. is that that artwork behind you with the skeleton on the motorcycle. It's, it's really cool. Um, that was done by... Tony Rio Negro, who did the uh, the backstage pass series uh, in '95, right before Jerry passed, and I was out in San Francisco in like uh, 2001, I think it was, or maybe 2000, and I was uh, at the Fillmore West at a Saturday night dance party, and Dick was the DJ, and they had Jerry's gear there. It was a cool cool thing they were doing there on Saturdays, and I left the venue, and I'm walking down the sidewalk, and I look on the sidewalk and there's a park bench and there's a guy sitting there so I walk over and it ended up being wavy gravy and he was sitting there on the park bench with this giant piece of cardboard with all the backstages from the final tour all laid out and each one was a little train car and the whole tour made up this train and I looked at him like dude that is really cool so he's like yeah and he's telling me all about it and it was a really cool experience because it was the first time I ever met him right so I'm like great to meet you have a good day see you later you know and I left and then like here I am 20 years later and I called this artist to um, see if he would consider doing our, our tour poster. And randomly I told him that story and at the very end, he just stayed quiet all through the story. At the very end he said, funny, I was the artist that did that. And I'm like, oh my God, really? I had no idea that Tony was the artist. And I just got his number because I saw something he did. And um, he, he's from New York. So he did that and he's doing a couple more for us for this talk about a connection wow I just got the, the awesome. samples today that's pretty awesome like, talk yeah about, like that is really cool i had something here i was gonna oh i do have something here uh because i actually have one uncut from 93 which i believe uh it's not really working because the background's getting in the way but you can kind of see that i think the graphics are very similar to his in terms of i think this might actually be his design too so that's actually when i saw it i was like wait a minute that looks a bit familiar actually it is his because that skeleton right there is exactly yeah. his artwork. So I, yeah, this is. Is, yeah, this is from 93 and it's actually, there it is. And this is actually my birthday, 92, my birthday shows on that. It actually makes up a, um, that's kind of cool. That's really cool. Like that you're yeah. on the, phone with the guy and then that story came up. That's amazing. And, and I love those little synchronicities. Like when I looked at your channel, I saw, oh, there's Tony, you know? So I, I did some volunteer work for the Jerry Garcia foundation, you know, Jerry's youngest daughter, Keelan and her mom, Manasha. And I met Tony Saunders through them and we played a bunch of shows together and he's great. Oh, you know, so, so, um, yeah. Um, they were the two things I wanted to say in addition to, you know, people can go to our website, which is rainbowfullsound.com and get all the info on all the shows on the tour and ticket info and all that. And also on Facebook at rainbow full, full of sound. 
So uh, that's how they can find us. Um, Beautiful. And I'll, yeah. I'll, include, I'll include, I include all those links in, I, in the video that I premiered last week. I'll also include them in the interview chat as well in the video description. So if anybody's listening and watching, scroll down to the video description, all the links to the rainbowfullofsound.com website, to the Facebook page, um, any other links I can find online to help promote or push the band will be there as well. Um, awesome, awesome opportunity. So this is how I end every one of my conversations with people. Um, it's um, something that uh, my wife found for me initially. She's my co-producer. And originally I was supposed to have my first chat was supposed to be with Donna, uh, but she declined for her reasons. And that's perfectly great. I love her. But my wife made some questions that I found really cool that sort of get a little bit more personal with everybody I speak with. And it's something that I find that my audience really likes as well. So if you're up for it, I'm going to shoot for about eight quick questions. They're like one word answers. And then cheers to hear your thoughts on them. Okay, hopefully. Yeah, let's say, yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite word? Oh, man. Never thought about it. Uh, That's why. Music. Beautiful. What is your least favorite word? Uh, can't. Can't. I like this. See, this person makes people think for a minute. My wife was awesome when she brought this together for me. What turned you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Uh, repeat that one. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Look at the juices flowing. Uh, that's a good question. Can I think on it for a second? Of course. You can take as long as you need. I can come back to it too at the end if you want. Yeah, come back to that one. All right. What turns you off? Negativity. Okay. What is your favorite curse word? Damn. What sound or noise do you love? Obviously the piano. What sound or noise do you not love? Um, it would have to be hardcore. Dennis McNally said construction. <laughs> <laughs> what profession other than your own would you have liked to attempt? Hmm, acting. Okay. What profession would you not like to ever have done or to do? Politics. If heaven exists, okay, let me go back to the other question first because that last one's got to be the last one. What turns you on or what gets the juices flowing for you creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Take your time. Yeah, it would, it came to me. It would probably have to be the um, experience of channeling energy. Very cool. Very cool. That's, that's a very cool. I really like that answer. Thank you. All right. Last one. If heaven exists, whatever that means to everybody and yourself, let's just keep it traditional and mainstream. What would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Oh, uh, you left the world a better place. Ah, beautiful. I love it. I love it. I think that's a great answer. Well, Dennis McNally said, where's my laminate? <laughs> <laughs> he wants to be backstage. He wants the access, right? <laughs> awesome. Well, Wayne, if you got nothing, nothing else you want to share with us or let us know about, I'm happy to take it on and listen, please. Otherwise, I just want to say, like, thank you for your time today. It's been really great uh, meeting you, catching up with you, hearing about this tour, hearing about yourself, you know, how this came to fruition and, you know, really understanding your passion for the keyboards and all that stuff. And um, I'm just really excited. And hopefully I can get down to a couple of these shows and come and support you guys on the road and really, really looking forward to even hearing this. So again, if you get any of this stuff gets recorded, any of these shows get video recorded, feel free to send me some and I'm happy to promote it even during the tour to try to increase more shows coming up in the future. So feel free. Cool. We appreciate it. And it's great what you do. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Wayne. I appreciate it. And again, keep in touch and I'm happy to help. Feel free to reach out because the worst I can do is say no. I, I, and I, rare, I rarely ever do. So feel free and I wish you all the best. If I don't happen to chat with you or converse with you between now and the tour, I wish you guys an awesome tour and best of luck. And hopefully we can talk again in the future and uh, connect again. Okay. Hope to see you on Halloween. Awesome, man. Thank you, Wayne. All right. Appreciate Thanks. you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.